And welcome back. It's been three weeks since Iraq went to the polls to elect a new parliament. Almost all of the votes have now been counted, but Iraq is still without a new government or a new prime minister. So why is it all taking so long? And who will be the leader of Iraq as the country prepares for the departure of US troops in August? And I'm joined now by Dr. Ghassan Atia, founder and director of the Iraq Center for Democracy uh, and Development. Uh, Ghassan, uh, welcome. Why is it taking so long to form a government? The, the electoral system that adopted in Iraq, proportional as well as multi-district, is bound to take longer time, especially when we have Iraqi expatriates have a right to vote abroad in addition to the quotas, so it will take them. In addition to that, there is a, a large number of complaints. It has to be sorted out. So I think if the, if the result will announce today, that will be good work. Was it, was it a, a free and fair election? That's a very good question. If you say free, it is definitely an improvement on what happened in 1905. 2005 was basically an election uh, dictated by a crisis of identity and the war of identity. So people voted a Shia or a Sunni or Kurd. In addition to that, the Sunni partially boycotted it and the result of it was highly polarized society which led Iraq to civil war. This election, the good thing about it, the Sunni, Arab Sunni, behaved differently and they joined the election in so strongly, more than 70% in the Sunni areas, which indicate full involvement. However, you ask the other s part of your question, is it fair? No, it's not fair. If the first election, 1905, was dictated by the militia lord, now it was dictated by the financial lords, those who got the money. We didn't have, uh, we don't have in Iraq a party law. So where you get your money, how you finance your campaign, it is up to them. The Iranians were a big supplier and supporter of some of the parties. Now in this round, the Arabs came heavily in support of some, and they lavishly spend money on them. Not only that, they helped even bringing them together it, it, in this election. Mr. Al-Maliki supported the ban on Sunnis. So is, is that going to make life very difficult uh, to produce a free and fair government? No doubt it's a better than in the past. Iraq is in a state of evolvement, incremental change, provided the train will remain on the rail, no problem, year to year, four years, it's no problem. But the problem is once the train is derailed, it happened in the almost civil war in the 2906 and 7. Now the question is, who has interest in derailing the process? Exactly, and who, who does? I doubt it now, because the Iraqi, the mood among the Iraqis are really, they are, have enough of the violence. In addition to that, my guess, all the neighboring countries, including Iran, are not, will not be happy to lose all for the sake of a new disturbances or upheaval. Have you, have you achieved democracy, or is this to use your analogy of the train station, another train ahead, another station ahead towards reaching your destination? The word democracy, the Jeffersonian or the Westminster democracy, this is far-fetched for us. What we are talking about now, even the American, the West, everyone, is stable Iraq. Without a stable Iraq, you will never get the American out of Iraq. You will never able to fulfill the 11 huge contract, oil contract with the big companies. So everything. So stability is. But instability, there is another dimension to it, power sharing. How can we share this power? Well, that's, that's the big problem. This is why so much wrangling has begun. The horse trading has started already, hasn't it? It has started. But again, we are, unfortunately, you cannot have democracy without Democrats. Democrats are rare animals in Iraq. We don't have a history in democracy. We don't have tradition in this. And thus, we are just trying to find our way out. However, now we are in a position. If these two big uh, lists, and Maliki and Alawi, are neck to neck, logically, logically, in any mature democracy, they will decide to join forces and form a government. But in our case, Again, unfortunately, what is logical doesn't apply in our case. They will fight each other. Each will try to create a new alliance with others. 
and to form a government to exclusion of the, the other party. If this happens, this really will be a disaster because if Al Maliki is excluded from and his group excluded from the government, this means the seven or nine Shia provinces will say we have been cheated. And here again, the Sunni and the Ba'asi back, back to power. So then we have to resort to force. In, so your, in your opinion, who in a year's time is going to be prime minister? Uh, well, it's very difficult with the Iraqi affair. Nobody could uh, tell. But I would say, if we are thinking in terms of stability in Iraq, if they will not join forces and form a, a, a government together, then maybe a dark horse will be the compromise. A compromise premier, not al Maliki and al Lawi, is appealing especially to the Kurds and to the INA, the Hakim group, because then they will be the kingmakers. As well, they don't want to see a strong prime minister. The one criticism against al Maliki, he was too strong for their, his own good. And al Lawi has all the potential of a new strong man. As a matter of fact, in Anbar, a Sunni area, on the TV, you ask one of the people, why, to whom did you vote? He said, I vote for Alawi. He said, why? He said, because he is Saddam without moustache. Gasa Matia, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. U.S. President Barack Obama has begun a nationwide tour of the country, taking his new health reforms to the people. The issue has dominated the first 14 months of his administration and may hang around for a few days more because... A technical challenge means a revote is needed in the House of Representatives. But the Democrats are confident the new law will stay. And one man who's delighted by that is James Clyburn, the House Majority Whip, whose job it was to get the bill through the House. And he joins me now from his office in Washington. Congressman, you've called this measure a defining moment in our nation's history. Yes, I did. Uh, and I think it is a very uh, defining moment. This is... Uh, something that's been attempted now for almost 100 years. Uh, we've come down from Theodore Roosevelt down through all presidents since, and in some form or another, they have called for some kind of uh, uh, health care plan that will allow all Americans to enjoy uh, affordable, accessible, uh, quality health care. Uh, we have seen very serious attempts made uh, by President Truman uh, over 60 years ago, and then uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, you saw uh, President Clinton uh, try to do this in a big way. Uh, we finally succeeded in doing it. Uh, this means that this uh, country has laid the foundation for having a very uh, universal uh, access to um, affordable, uh, quality health care. That makes us a real big deal. In fact, I've called it the, um, uh, a, the Civil Rights Act uh, for the 21st century. Well, assuming the revote goes through, this is clearly a huge feather in the cap of the Obama presidency. But does that merit, do you think, the amount of time and the effort that's been put into this bill. Has all that effort, all that energy over the past 14 months taken the early shine, perhaps, off the Obama presidency? Well, this was a big deal, and I can understand why a lot of people felt uh, that going after this uh, reform measure uh, was um, putting uh, it ahead of a lot of other things like job creation. But you know, uh, if you look at the campaign, people tend to measure your uh, success as a president against the things you promised during your campaign. And these same people who are giving Barack Obama a hard time uh, because he has done this will be the same people who will be there, uh, out there saying, well, that's, he did do this and the other, but he didn't do what he promised to do, and he promised uh, to deliver uh, universal access to health care. So he was uh, be damned if he did and be damned if he didn't. And what about Guantanamo Bay, which you've said is just a bad deal for our relationships? Should Guantanamo Bay be his next priority? 
Well, I think it is. I think we've already seen uh, that uh, he's been working in a bipartisan way in the Senate. Uh, Senator Graham, for instance, has already uh, indicated that they, um, they may be close to doing something. We know where he wants to put a new facility. The community there seems to be uh, uh, very much amenable to that. It, it, and it is his home state of Illinois where he plans to do this. Uh, and I think from all that I've heard uh, that they are uh, very close uh, to getting this done. And, and so I think that's going to get done. And you look forward to that day? Well, sure. I mean, you know, I don't know if it's as big a deal as it is getting people back to work. I mean, where you house prisoners got very little to do uh, with the domestic uh, problems we have in this country. Uh, it was just sort of a public relations problem for us. Well, the seemingly frozen Middle East peace process may be seen in just such a way, perhaps. Could, could it, could it uh, be that the empowerment that President Obama has enjoyed from this health care victory could now be used to take to the Middle East peace process uh, a, new, a new momentum? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, the whole thing here is, can this guy close? He can open, but he can't close. Well, he's demonstrated here that he can close with the biggest deal that's been undertaken uh, in a long, long time. Uh, so it will give him uh, sort of uh, uh, more energy. Uh, it, it will uh, calm things down a bit. Uh, I think that uh, getting this health care thing done uh, renews his spirit uh, as well as his influence. Should he take on Prime Minister Netanyahu and force himself onto the peace process? I'm not an expert in that business, and I try not to get out there uh, telling anybody what to do. I would love for us to find a workable two-state solution uh, to that Middle East problem, and I think it's got to be a two-state solution. I would hope uh, that we can find the will on both sides to get that done. Now, exactly how to go about doing that, I'll leave that up to his foreign policy experts. Of which, of course, there are plenty. And just a final uh, question on foreign affairs. President Obama has been wrapped up in health care. Does he need to look more at international affairs now? Well, uh, I think that President Obama uh, needs to make sure uh, that uh, he keeps the home fires burning, so to speak. Uh, sure. Uh, he ought to stay engaged uh, on the international front. Uh, but you know, if you got a choice between getting the health care uh, program done or going off to Australia, uh, as you notice, he put the trip off until June to go to Australia uh, and other places so they could get this done. I think the priority is to get his constituents feeling good about themselves and good about him. To be off in some foreign country working on foreign affairs and your constituents back home aren't feeling good about you, uh, that's not a good place to be. And so I think he was right to do what he did. And I think it's also uh, uh, very important for us to build upon that. We just can't say it's all over and that's it. Uh, we got to build upon this because we're just laying the foundation here. We're going to re revisit this health care uh, issue many, many times again. And, of course, it was foreign affairs which put such a blight on the Bush presidency. You wouldn't want a repeat of that, would you? Well, that's quite true. But, you know, uh, a lot of it, I think that uh, Bush got defined in a big sort of way by uh, his reaction to Katrina and Rita. Uh, and I think that, you know, when things are good at home, uh, uh, people aren't going to have much respect for you abroad. You can't go out to the other foreign countries telling people how they conduct their businesses and they look at you and you ain't conducting yours at home. So I think that uh, it was important for him to, to get this, uh, this victory on health care uh, because I think um, uh, it helps him uh, when he goes abroad. James Clyburn, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.
The provocative new comedy film, The Infidel, opens in a couple of weeks. I'll be meeting its star, Omid Jalili, after this short break. <laughs>